thank uh, everyone for uh, joining us here today. Uh, my name is Jack Liu. I'm the Deputy Secretary of State uh, with special responsibility for management and resources. Um, I, uh, I, the previous uh, incarnation was the Director of the Office of Management and Budget and worked on these kind of IT and management issues government-wide. Uh, and in between, spent a few years in the private sector in the university world and the financial services industry where I also had responsibility for uh, technology planning and decisions. So for me, it's a special honor to sit with a distinguished group like this uh, in order to, to tackle what is really a very, very significant question. How do we um, get better value in, uh, in how we uh, plan and purchase IT systems and manage them for the federal government? How do we have a return on our investments that warrants uh, the, the very substantial uh, investments that we make? Um, we, uh, you know, we, uh, we all come to this with perspectives uh, that, that are general and particular, but uh, in, the, in the past uh, uh, year, we're looking through the lens of an agency, um, you know, I, I, I guess I see a slightly different picture than I saw when I looked at the whole government, and it's interesting uh, to look at the contrast. You know, from an agency perspective, um, you know, you're, you're focusing on getting your work done. You, you have current missions and you have things that you want to do. And you look at a, a world uh, which doesn't lend itself uh, easily to uh, strategic planning, uh, particularly in an area like IT, where uh, decisions are made um, based on what you know today um, and in the, in the system that we have, they're probably not implemented for the better part of two years until after you make them because the funding doesn't come along right away. Uh, and I guess I would, I would put a couple of uh, questions uh, uh, out there just on my own, uh, just by way of introduction, that, that one of the things we need to uh, learn uh, from you on and hear from your experience on is how do we, um, how do we uh, look at the work we're doing to have a mechanism to detect problems early so that if we need to change course, uh, we can do it before we've gotten so deep into a project that it becomes both too costly and too difficult to change. Um, and uh, I mean, at the risk of oversimplifying it, how do we uh, get to the place where our strategy drives our systems as opposed to our systems uh, uh, are determining our strategy? Um, and the two are related because um, if, if uh, our strategies are evolving and our systems are locked, it's very hard uh, to not get in the place uh, where at some point you do the best you can with the system uh, that you decided on whether or not it reflects your current strategy. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with a, a colleague from OMB that I think needs no introduction to uh, anyone here, Vivek Kundra, who comes to government with a, a you know, to the federal government with a, a proud record of accomplishment uh, in state government as one of the leading uh, you know, thinkers uh, about uh, IT questions. And it's really a, it's it's an honor to chair the panel with him and to have uh, to have him uh, working across the government uh, in this area. And uh, we also uh, are joined by uh, two other deputy secretaries. Uh, um, we both here. Uh, and Neil Wollen is uh, deputy secretary of the Department of Treasury. And. I'd be willing to come down to Secretary for Management okay. here for Jane. That's so that, I, I, I knew that uh, I was not seeing my other colleague. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, without uh, taking further time, I, uh, I'd like to ask Vivek if you could introduce the topic that we're here to discuss a little bit uh, and then uh, really get to the purpose of today's session, which is for us to listen uh, to you uh, so that we can learn from your experience and uh, then regroup with uh, our colleagues uh, to, to to uh, share what we've learned. Great. Thanks, Jack. And uh, thank you to all of you for uh, doing a wonderful job, actually, on the homework assignment that we sent. <laughs> it was extremely insightful um, in terms of the feedback that we got and uh, detailed feedback as far as what the United States government could do to address some of the toughest problems that it faces when it comes to managing over $76 billion and information technology projects. What was really interesting uh, in terms of consistent themes was as a function of the grading exercise, what we noticed was that a lot of people converged on strategic plans driving IT investments. That actually ended up ranking as the number one thing. It scored about 26 points. And right below that, at about 25 points, 
was oversight that gives us early warnings. And we saw that consistently, whether it was Weyerhaeuser or United or Air Products, across the board, we were getting feedback around that. What was really interesting uh, to the IT community was that shared services and uh, lightweight technologies ranked at zero. No one really talked about technology itself, but it was very much focused around strategy driving uh, information technology and more importantly, having a robust governance infrastructure. And below that, what we thought would have ranked higher was our measuring and tracking return on investment, and then of course, business risk itself. That ranked uh, fairly low. But what was really interesting as we went through the homework assignment itself was just a lot of the feedback we got and bringing to life some of the examples, and we'd love to engage in the discussion where we can bring theory to life through how you're actually doing it, and what could the government do, learning from how you've managed really complex IT projects where you've delivered some of these initiatives on time, on budget, but more importantly, producing the dividends that were promised up front, which seems to be one of the challenges within the government itself. I just had one question. Is this an on-the-record session uh, today, right now, I know in the big group it was, just to make sure that we know how our comments will be, uh, will or might, might be taken. Yes, it's actually on the record and it's being broadcast live. Great. These are real networks. Maybe use more technology. I'd be happy if that were the case. And if I can just add one more housekeeping item before we open it up for, for full discussion. Uh, we've asked uh, Dan Fulton from Weyerhaeuser uh, to uh, uh, and he's graciously, graciously agreed to uh, uh, be the reporter back to the group for our session here. So um, when we wrap up with this conversation, we will just reserve a few minutes to sit down and prepare that so that we can go back and make sure we've uh, reflected everything uh, well. Sure, so, so maybe we can start uh, with Glenn, uh, with you to talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing in terms of United Airways as far as really focusing on uh, the strategy and how that's really driving a lot of your investments across the board. So, so I'd, I'd offer two thoughts about um, issues that we confront now that are different than those that we would have confronted previously. Uh, number one, the, the industry is uh, changing worldwide by the convergence of networks. So partnership is driving a good bit of how the consolidation in this industry is going to evolve over time. So if you, if you think of developing a strategic plan for a United Airlines, Lufthansa, Air Canada, and Continental as opposed to simply United, the challenge that you've highlighted here is exponentially more complex because of the legacy systems that exist in all of those companies. And the, but the response to it is actually the same. And putting the outcome and the strategic plan of the association of, say, an immunized joint venture across the Atlantic Ocean with those four companies together with a board of governance that understands that it's the ambition of the joint venture that actually provides both of those first two, uh, a clear delineation of where the destination is for the business opportunity, and secondly, the oversight giving early warning so that in the event that the technology obsolesces, then there are exit ramps to the plan, no different from any other business plan or any of the significant capital investment where we can actually move off of it. But the most important thing about it and is the ability to work across governance structures that are different from your own and render them uh, subordinate to the overarching ambition of the project or the business proposition. If that's a little too abstract, which I don't think it is, but uh, our working with uh, the Department of Transportation and the FAA on air traffic control modernization, which remains an enormous frustration uh, for not only us, but for all of the traveling uh, colleagues that we have around the table and all of your executives and managers, uh, getting to the point where, frankly, change in governance, I mean, you, you have a unique dilemma I think, in public service in the government, and that's uh, things called elections. Uh, and obviously you have to find a way to deal through change in, in authority and administration, which 
I think is less pervasive in the private sector. But it's really analogous to our, our other partnership. For all of us at the, in the air transport business, establishing what the IT solution is to the modernization of something such as the air traffic control system requires, requires really a continuity of purpose and an ambition that transcends governance change. Because your governance change is more emphatic than probably ours. So I would just echo those major points that we brought together. And I thank you for the opportunity to do the homework assignment because, frankly, it allowed us sincerely to refresh our thinking on some very appropriate questions. If, if I could pick up and ask a question um, uh, based on the governance system uh, point. Right. Um, I think in an, in, in an ironic way, um, our governance uh, structure is more clear and, and more, more emphatic, but also um, uh, more rigid. Um, to the extent that uh, you know, businesses have a bottom line, elected officials have uh, accountability you know, on election day, and a change means you have a whole change of, of objective in many cases. That's a very emphatic kind of change. Uh, but there's the other side of government, which is that um, you know, you know, we're about to you know, release a budget uh, in February, uh, which will take effect you know, in October, and the planning process began you know, a year or more ago. Um, you know, from my brief period in business, um, the, the, the decisions on IT uh, were more quarterly decisions than they were, you know, two year ahead decisions. There was a running list of objectives and then there were resource uh, decisions that were put against what were uh, uh, business uh, needs uh, as they were evolving. And you know, we, we, we're in a world where if you change um, you know, a year into your planning process, um, it might take you another two years to, to get funding for it. Uh, I say, Jack, two things. Number one, I think it probably depends on the magnitude of the capital investment that, that the project requires and the extent to which change is an inherent risk in the success of the, the project that you've agreed so that it, it is a long-term commitment rather than a short-term commitment. And the process of change would be very destructive to the presumption of whatever the return is that you've calculated for the project. The one that I used is the one that if you can imagine how difficult it would be to change a project that involves four different companies with four different governance process. That's really why I chose that example. Right. Uh, the other thing that I, I say is it, it, governance really goes to, you know, authority and prerogative for having the authority to be able to make a change even if the change is, rec is necessary or not. And I think one of the challenges that you have is every CEO sitting around the table has authority over the various internal bureaucracies that we govern. I think that the challenge of separate departments within different agencies is more profound for you to govern in your respective new responsibilities than it is within Warehouse or within Air Products or United. It is even more profound difference government, which is that, you know, when you want to commit resources, you know, you can go to your board of directors, you can commit resources. Right. Apart from the lag effect that Jack talks about, we got to go to Congress. And so, um, in many cases, the sort of authority control set of questions is massively more complicated by just the basic structure of our government and the extent to which, at a macro level for sure, but increased, you know, often at quite a granular level. These are decisions that, funding decisions that are ours to propose but not ours to make. Well, I think, Neil, I'm going to yield here, but I think to the extent that, that you have countervailing issues that you have to work through, and, and through the process of your, of your governance or your approval or your authority to actually invest the sums, uh, such as, say, perhaps a political consideration that, that pushes against the modernization. Uh, for reasons that could be territorial or that could be bureaucratic or they simply could be differences of legitimate opinion or uh, it could be that the modernization actually is going to reduce jobs. Let me, let me ask um, uh, John to jump in from Electronic Arts to talk about how do you get executive sponsorship, right? Because that's one of the core issues and you're running a, a very high tech company uh, where you're looking for talent globally. Uh, when you're driving IT investments, how are you making sure, because that's something we share in the public sector too, 
is making sure that there is alignment between business and in technology. So, um, it's a pretty broad question, but I'll try to tackle it. The, uh, with any sort of multinational technology company, um, and then I did list executive sponsorship as the number one issue. And what I was getting at was having clarity of purpose, clarity of design, clarity of what we're trying to get out of a significant IT investment. Um, and then making sure that once we've designed or, or defined the project goals, you know, while they can change in response to differing circumstances or new information in the marketplace, they largely remain intact through the process of implementation. And a second factor that I would um, raise is that um, earlier in my career when I was working on ERP implementations for, you know, prior companies, enterprise software companies, we did implementations in terms of just keeping track of the books. It was invariable where the French would want it one way and the Germans would want it a little bit different, the Italians would want it one way, the Americans would want it one way, all with their own custom touch and interface and um, tools and tech and implementation connection to things that they'd done previously. And if I were to identify the two major pitfalls to successful IT implementation as I see it, one is lack of clarity up front and the other is feature bloat. And so when you're trying to put things in place to um, solve for three important problems, you can often do that well. When you then add the three things from 17 countries and three more departments, et cetera, and the, the project objective list starts to be you know, 60, 70 goals, 80 goals, 100 goals um, incorporated. And on top of that, individuals that might be engaged in a steering committee having a different view of what those goals might actually mean. You can take something that can be relatively simple to deliver and achieve its major goals in a three month, six month, nine month, 12 month period and multiply that by 5x, sometimes 10x, and drive yourself into project failure. So when what I try to do now to answer your question is to make sure that we are absolutely clear about what we're trying to achieve and that we trim away as many of the ornaments as we possibly can to get to vanilla implementation. Um, a lot of the enterprise software companies or the IT companies that I see, they actually make pretty good products that can sometimes be taken, you know, quote unquote, out of the can and onto your server and actually work. Um, and what, you know, I, I don't know, know that I've ever been involved in an IT project that didn't cost more for customization than the core license of the software. And frankly, it's nuts. So my advice, clear project leadership, extremely narrowly defined purpose, to the degree possible, of course, leave the back door for future flexible you know, additions or connections. But it needs to be run with a strong hand, both at the project management level and the executive sponsorship level, to make sure that happens. And when you're subjected to what I suspect you are, and we had a chance earlier to talk a little bit about this, of uh, competing agendas from different agencies or different constituencies in one large bureaucracy, and they all have their say, I don't know how you can make it work in an efficient way. Keep it narrow, keep it tight, and make it happen. And could you maybe say a few more words about that back door? Because to the extent that um, you have a system where the four corners define what you're doing, um, it does force the resolution of, of, kind of the differences of stakeholders at the front end. To the extent that you design an effective uh, back door where you can come back and revisit it and do things incrementally, um, it, it potentially changes the shape of the process. Are there best practices on that? Well, again, I think this is where, you know, flexibility and design comes into account. So, um, I mean, 15 years ago, I was involved with a significant ERP implementation where we had to define our chart of accounts, put codes in place for those particular charts of accounts so that you know, each classification of expense had a place to live in an ERP um, database. We're currently now putting a, with an electronic artist, we're capturing we captured the last year 50 million unique users with a database of our customers and all their permissions to use our various products, what they're allowed to use, what we've, you know, they're allowed to play Madden, but they're not allowed to play NBA Live because they paid me for Madden, but not for NBA Live, that type of thing. And um, invariably, you can have um, a database that might have, frankly, the flexibility of unlimited number of fields that you can later define for what data you might want to capture or what. DRM system you might want to implement or what permission system you might want to allow for. And what I'm talking about with flexibility is a lot of times people will try to hard code their version, their view, their window. 
And what that causes is literally massive customization. If you work with any sort of reasonable current day technology, the, the idea that the system's flexible to add you know, future requirements for screening it one way or another and not having to define it up front, that exists. That exists in virtually any technology we're implementing or it can be built into any technology. Where it gets to be problematic is um, a lot of times, you know, if you have a, a group of people collectively designing the outcomes or, or collectively designing what they believe to be their objectives, they get in this mode of dreaming of the 15 different ways they might want to use it. Um, you know, they, they start to think that I might want to use it when I'm at home, and I might want to use it when I'm on my Blackberry, and I might want to use it when I'm on my iPhone. That's all fine, and that's actually pretty easily accomplished with the various technologies that exist today. But they also start to imagine that they, they want to have it um, in you know, hard-coded reports that look 15 different ways. And, and they ask for it because they can dream of it. They can imagine it. And not because it's essential. And so I guess my advice to you would be cut all that is not absolutely essential to the mission. And then when it comes to the fields that you might ultimately populate, um, I don't know, no-fly lists and connecting them to visas, if you're, that's a feature that you hadn't previously done, that's a relatively yeah, easy. Yeah. It just might be an issue. Um, if that's the data set you want to later collect, if you've got an open architecture to the actual underlying database, um, and I think virtually all of them do, you can accommodate that later. But keep it narrow and tell people to stop dreaming and focus on what the principal objectives are. So, so John and uh, Shantana, you know, you're, you're both in the technology business and um, you work on a lot of these projects. You sell to customers and they implement really large-scale IT projects. In your experience, where do you see success versus failure? I actually agree. I mean, I, we, we uh, first of all, uh, people who try to change too many things up front. Um, you know, one other thing that I see the government project always we, we get involved with um, too many people writing the, writing the specs. I think that's, that's the one thing that I, I you know, in, in private enterprise, we don't have that luxury because it's, as my guys start debating what a spec looks like for the next systems, uh, I'll be out of business before. You know, um, so what we normally do is, uh, so when you say IT is strategic fit, for example, I'll give you a, a real life example of what we're doing. All right? um, so we are, like a lot of tech companies, we bought a lot of companies. So each company has a different order entry system, so I'll just make one um, statement. And so because of uh, efficiency and return on investment, we made it work. So everything is like a boating, you know, things are connected kind of loosely, whatever. And then every so often we decided to do a clean cleaning of the whole system and make a very elegant system. And oftentimes what we find out it work is we get the team together, we define what the needs ought to be, and then we stop the spec right there. And then we empower one group, whether it's the IT group or whoever, go do it. And then everybody use off the shelf. Now this is a very important thing because if you don't use off the shelf, then it goes to the 15 different way of hot wiring reports comes out. And the answer is no, 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 and no, and, and because we just can't. I, oftentimes what you do is you get something accomplished, everybody then adopt, uh, you know, adopt it and adapt to it. Uh, if you let people just have a say up front, I mean, I know it's too autocratic or whatever the right word is, but, but it works for, best for us. And uh, we save a lot of money, we, we get it done. And every kind of, every, uh, after a while, the culture is that if you don't, give your input in the very beginning, which is very limited in time, then you just, you just have to you know, do your best with it, whatever it is. And there will be a next cycle. So, um, and that's how we advise our customer to. Um, and and it, works, it works pretty well. Uh, you, you, and now, if we started deviating from the spec too much, because there are no such off-the-shelf technology, we tend to cancel the project. So we're not shy on saying that maybe, maybe what, you know, like we're going to implement certain SAP function, for example. We're going to just use the standard SAP function. And everybody just go around, you know, you change the business rule around it. Um, otherwise, it'd be a, a sinkhole of money and time. So Vivek, we have, a, I think, an interesting uh, challenge in that we both deliver, as you know, a lot of software and we use a lot of software. When you're, when you're delivering uh, software that people download to the tune of 
nine million uh, a day. It just means that that software then that people uh, is out there in the public domain. So the ability to change uh, that software is very hard. So we're very cautious about it. But two thoughts come to mind. The first is uh, we're firm believers in rather than starting at it from what are you trying to accomplish at the back end, put the individual or the user at the center of everything that you do. We're big believers in design matters. And if people are going to use that technology, it's going to be successful and it's going to be effective. And I think to the points that were made earlier, the more complexity you have in all the features that you are trying to put in, the less it's going to get used, which means the less it's going to be effective for the constituencies that you're trying to address. So um, we solicit feedback a lot. One of the things we're finding as tech is emerging is you know, the viral nature of how people use software it tells you something, and I think you know. Traditionally, enterprises have tried to mandate software without necessarily listening to what people are using, and I think there's a lesson in that for all of us because what's being used frequently, if you look at all of the pieces of software that have had explosive growth, it's because people like using it, and you know it's intuitive, it's easy to use, so design matters. Second thing, I'll I think reiterate something that folks have said, which is complexity. Uh, I'm a firm believer anything that takes more than 18 months is probably too complex and is probably going to be obsolete by the time you implement it. So keep it simple, uh, have the right architectural attributes to it, but build as you go rather than try and have a grand unification of all the architectures because I don't think that exists. I just want to chime because uh, we have a side of our business that's very much like John and uh, Shanti's business, and then we have side of our business is more like John's business where we are consumer facing on the technology side. Now, I would, there are three things that, uh, three things they've said that I think I are hugely agree with and one I'd add. Uh, the first is what John said, using off-the-shelf components uh, to the greatest extent possible. In, in this new open source world, uh, the range of tools that are off-the-shelf are available and the richness of what they make possible. And I, I, every time I deal with an old-style IT organization, I find that there's just a level of institutional um, resistance to that because it's a totally different methodology. So both off the shelf and recognizing that in this open source world, the shelf has gotten so much bigger and the stuff on the shelf gets better and better every day. So I think uh, having an openness to those kinds of methodologies and really uh, not mandating them, of course, because that's a silly thing to do, but uh, educating the IT organizations on that range of options and that range of choices is hugely important. Uh, second, something Shantanu said about the feedback loop, and I know John mentioned it as well. But one of the things we've learned in both our internal systems and our customer-facing work is that uh, uh, the, the world we're in involves so much feedback, and if you build that feedback loop into the system while you're deploying it, um, uh, obviously you, you want to take feedback that's consistent with the strategic plan. Your product or service will get so much better, and you will make, you will build a different kind of relationship with the customer, instead of relationship being a one-way relationship, I'm giving you information, I'm delivering you a service. It's a two-way relationship where the uh, the recipient of the service actually can provide feedback directly in along the development of that, you know, going from version one to version two, et cetera. Uh, it's one of the most powerful things we've seen in all of the systems we've deployed. And the third, this goes back to, to, to John's point earlier and has been made by a few people. Uh, knowing who the customer is and being super crisp about that is incredibly important. Uh, typically, executive sponsorship is a great way of doing that. Uh, we, we, do, we deploy systems for uh, end customers and we build systems for ourselves. I'm very pleased to say that our success rate with the systems we're deploying for end customers, carrier customers like Verizon or T-Mobile or AT&T or, or the like around the world, uh, is very high, you know, about 98, 99% success rate of deployment uh, because it's business and commercial critical. I would say, and it's a little bit harder to quantify because of the, the fact that you can have a system that uh, is deploys, but there's a little bit of a stumble, that on our internal systems, our success rate by the same quality metrics is probably more like 85%. And I ascribe that delta to the fact that you have an incredibly high level of measurability on who the customer is when you have a formal change order process and the customer either has to agree to the change order process or say, no, I won't take the change order, I'd rather not add that to the system. So I think the there's a, there's a level of benefit associated with the formality of the economic measurement that you intrinsically have in that commercial situation. Uh, I can only imagine the system that Glenn described where you have this hybrid of your system, your partner airline, the FAA, where it's a hybrid, it must get really complicated, so I know it's not always that black and white, but the more you can build that measurability, 
which is kind of a combination of the first two uh, the, uh, me uh, measures that our group collectively scored so high. I guess the whole group scored so high, uh, the better than we do. So that'd be sort of my, my synthesis for being on both the, the billing systems for our own internal use uh, and billing systems for, for carrier customers and other partners. But you know, for a lot of the things that we do in government, it, it kind of starts out closer to Glenn's model. I mean, uh, if we talk about sharing data across uh, government agencies, it, it's probably more different than different airlines uh, because there were systems that were built to achieve different purposes, uh, not systems that were built to get to the same end. And I think we've seen on many occasions that that's a big challenge for us in, in, in government to 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 and to to ask the question, if you were starting from scratch, how would you do it, um, is very different from asking the question, looking ahead, knowing that strategically it's so important for us to be able to collaborate across agencies. How do we think about an IT strategy uh, that builds bridges um, and uh, uh, I, I think the point that, you just, just one comment on Rob's point, is it, it's a function really uh, of what John was saying, in, in my opinion, across business units or across certainly corporate entities or departments. And it has a lot to do with, uh, I think, uh, how you establish the, uh, the premium for success. I mean, we, what you heard everybody say is you've got to find a way to get the tendency to make more complex or the tendency to perceive um, discretion when that discretion is capricious rather than contributive to whatever the goal may be, whether you're a for-profit or you're not. And I, I, I agree with you. I think yours is actually even greater than transatlantic. You know, talking to the Germans, <laughs> <laughs> which I can I can assure you has its challenges. But uh, at the end we of the day, it, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> if you agree the size of the prize and you agree what that prize looks like, and and you have, and I guess I left this out. You know, Rob sort of mentioned if you have executive sponsorship that, that defines prerogative and discretion and you know, the tendency to do exactly what the other gentleman discussed, I, I think you have the discipline that... Also, Jack, I, I, you know, I, I all, I, and there's always a balance somewhere. I, I, we, we all wanted every agency to share information. Let's just for now forget about either the sensitivity of information, so the need to know, so just forget about the business group for a second. You're building the bridge, you know, when I build a bridge, it's always one point to one point. I know this seems to be, you know, connecting two silos only and you have 60, 60 silos and you want to connect it all, but you got to think about whether that's even possible. Uh, I, I, I actually normally think that, you know, we, we ought to build some, you know, maybe two or three different organizations that, that, that share the information first and then as everybody build on top of that. Otherwise, we start having a spec that has uh, you know, 60 different inputs, you, you, you don't have enough time just to have that discussion. Forget about, by the time you're done with that discussion, people changes and stuff like that, you start all over again. And God forbid you already procure some software or whatever. I mean, at that time you say, well, we don't need this because it's useless. And I think if, if I look at, you know, I know whether the sensors or whatever, I mean, there's a lot of projects, it all were extremely well intended in the beginning of time. And, the, and, 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 it, and it was great, it, it was modernization and stuff, and then, and then all the requirements start creeping in at times elapses. And then everybody said, oh, well, we, we do it this way, now there's a newer technology, we could use Google Desktop, whatever it is, you know, I'm making it up as I go. Right? So then, then, then eventually you get to the point that this, this, this resulting project has nothing, has very little resemblance of how we started. And, and in business, Accountability creeping, a bunch of people get fired, blah 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 blah, and you know, and it won't last to that long. And and, and but in government agency, just because you need to make sure that everybody's a stakeholder, I think that may be a fallacy by itself. So can I? Can I, I mean, I'm just, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't mean to pretend to know your business. I'm just, you know, su suggesting that it's kind of a n-dimensional cube that doesn't have an answer. I would love to shift the discussion in terms of what this has been very insightful in terms of how you launch IT projects. Mm -hmm. What do you do once they're in flight? You've got a whole portfolio. And John, uh, you had some interesting responses in terms of what you were doing at uh, Air Products and Chemicals and also Dan at Warehouser. Uh, once you have a portfolio of investments, uh, how do you manage them? How do you make the decisions? Where to continue investing? Where to divest? Where to course correct? Well, yeah, 
I, I'll answer that in one second. The one comment that I'd make, uh, and maybe even before that, is that I, I think we looked at, at this as an investment in our business first, and that was a real fundamental shift in our thinking about IT. Historically, IT was something that um, delivered a solution to the business. Uh, there wasn't a lot of ownership. You know, in other words, here's what I want, go away. It, it either didn't work, largely not because the IT didn't work, but because the definition, the scope of what was trying to be achieved was never tied down at the beginning. Uh, and then there wasn't sufficient ownership at the business level uh, to deliver and, and drive that. You got to put in, uh, in my mind, a very rigorous governance structure. And, you know, a big part of our business is building plants that we own and operate all over the world, thousands of them. Uh, we invest a lot of capital in that. Uh, and so we have a very project oriented mentality. And we took that and applied this to really transforming. Uh, and I admit completely jackets and, and, and Vivek, it's a lot easier in an enterprise like ours than it is in a, in a government, but in many, many ways, we were in 40 countries, uh, multiple systems, multiple silos, thousands of facilities around the globe. Everybody knew they had the best way uh, to do it. Uh, and we basically went and uh, set some principles around one company, said we're gonna use one system, we're gonna use you know, 80 plus percent of the functionality of that system, uh, and then we didn't take any prisoners, to be blunt. Uh, and we reviewed it. Uh, as an executive leadership team, you know, every week we had a standing meeting of, the, of our corporate executive committee. Where are we? You know, it's as simple as red light, green light. Where do we have problems? Who's not on board? A particular department or a particular country or a particular business wasn't on board. Somebody in that room had responsibility for it. And we had basically said, we're not going to tolerate that. And we went out and heard what, you know, in some cases there were valid reasons why it wouldn't work, and we dealt with those. But those were way, way, way uh, a very small part of the, of the total pie. We, we didn't really give too many exceptions. Drove the project, and we've got a single instance CRP globally on you know, 95 plus percent of our revenue. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, to bring that to life, in terms of how do you actually, do you have a special set of tools or processes uh, in terms of how you look at these investments across the company? I, I, you know, in, in reality, um, every investment, whether it be an IT investment, whether it be a new plant, has to have a benefits case. And you've got to drill those benefits and it, hard enough to understand, are they real? And then once you define that, who's accountable for delivering them? And then review it sort of on the, the number two point up there on a frequent enough basis to make sure uh, you're really uh, getting what you started out uh, to get. I mean, we, quite frankly, I won't use names, but we got about a year into the project, uh, and through these reviews, it wasn't getting anywhere near we want, where we wanted to go. We changed the leadership. We changed some of the outside help that we had uh, supporting the project. You know, and so we had the conviction to say, hold it, stop. This one's off track. We're not going to end up with what we want, uh, and it's not going to support the performance of our business. And so we did. So stop it. Maybe you maybe could talk for just a minute about the threshold for making a decision that says stop and making a decision to change you know, the team. Right. There, are, there are significant costs to each uh, to decisions like that. Sure. Um, yeah, presumably, um, there, it, it wasn't uh, just a little bit of an incremental challenge. Was, was, it, was it, did you feel that it, was, it had to be mission critical uh, that, that you couldn't get your goal accomplished, or that it was going to be more costly, uh, take longer? Just a, a little color about how you make the, the go, no-go decision. Yeah, I, I think the fundamental thing was we, when we, we went back to the touchstones of what we were trying to achieve with this transformation and where we were going, which was some of the, the comments that others made, trying to accommodate each and every individual's idea. And I'm exaggerating here a little because I, I go back to, you know, we were pretty harsh on that. But trying to, well, you don't understand. My business in this market, in this country, is very different than your business. And, you know, and yeah, it is at the interface between the customer. But 90% of it back isn't, you know. And we had 35 order entry systems around the globe. We have three today. And those three are a function of the three main business models that we operate. And guess what? It works in Korea, works in Japan, it works in Texas, works in the United Kingdom. Uh, and because of that, 
we can share best practices and rapidly de deploy those capabilities uh, to where we need it. Uh, but you have to go back to, you know, the, the touchstones, go back to my earlier comment. We looked at it less as an IT project and much more as a business strategy. Uh, got the leadership on board, put a governance structure in, looked at our processes and said, we don't need 34. We might not get away with one, but we know we can do a lot less than 34. We got to three. Uh, and when people wanted to make three, six, or nine, the reviews that we had, the standing steering committee meeting every Monday morning, I didn't particularly like it at 7.30 in the morning either, but, but you know, that flushed out ideas, or I mean, flushed out problems. Uh, and generally, there was someone in the room that had the accountability then to go solve that. We had a smaller three-person executive team that was, you know, obviously spending more than the once a week or once every two week meetings that I'm talking about that was all over this. And scope changes, no matter how big or how small, were just rigorously challenged. Uh, you know, and, and there's the old adage in any, any you know, the 80-20 rule applies here. Get it out, get it running. Don't assume it's going to be perfect. If you go in trying to get the perfect output, you'll never get an output. Get the output uh, and then go back and identify where you can improve. You know, we look at, you know, I think to your very specific point, you know, I don't think investments in tools that don't give you a two, three year payback are worth the investments in things like this. No different than in a plant. You know, uh, you know, so, you know, we've looked at it in, in, in that context. And how about um, you, Dan, and Warehouser, how are you approaching? You've got a huge portfolio. I'm reflecting that I wish I would have had this meeting before we made some of the changes <laughs> <laughs> that we've implemented. I mean, a lot of our IT is, is basic business uh, manufacturing process control, but we've been through a major change um, in implementing an enterprise system. Uh, and I'm, I'm struck by a couple of things. Uh, number one is that I do think you need to simplify the business process before you automate it. And, and otherwise, you, do, you, you drive yourself to complexity, you know, whether it's order entry systems. Uh, I mean, we had different businesses that had the same customers, but we had different databases. And they didn't, they were, quite frankly, we weren't able to share information and consolidate across even our businesses. Uh, and so we've made progress there, but, but the focus know that we've uh, driven on is uh, is trying to simplify the process first haven't always been successful in doing so you know we have us we have a gating process for IT investment that is no different than the gating process that we have for other capital investments and so we you know we spend time identifying the scope and then we manage it uh, I was also struck by a comment about 18 months and, uh, you know my IT director uh, used 18 months as the time frame Thing. You shouldn't be doing anything that takes longer than 18 months because then the world starts to change and that creates problems. Uh, the other significant learning for me and for our company, I think, is that the, the businesses have to own the solution, you know, and otherwise they will never embrace it. You know, rather than it being an IT driven technology solution, if the businesses own it, then, then we'll, we'll get to the finish line. But if they don't, then we're going to have problems. And I, there was a 60 Minutes story on this past weekend, and it was about a government project implementing surveillance along the Mexican border. And, and my takeaway from that one 10 or 15 minute story was that, that the solution provider never talked to the customer, you know, which was the border agency. And so perhaps they were delivering a solution that wasn't usable uh, or manageable. And, and I think many times we err on the side of the technology solution where we've been successful is when the business really embraces it. Uh, and I think routine review and, and, uh, and business commitment uh, all along the way is critical. And, and as, as we drove a, a major enterprise solution across our company, our portfolio changed radically. And, you know, it would have been better had we been more adept in identifying some of those changes coming along we probably would have adjusted the project. And so I, that gets to this time frame. Uh, looking out over a three to five year implementation period is in real estate. It's a thing you talked about uh, in your homework assignment about IT failures and how that may be indicative of uh, not just how you manage them, but core problems of the organization itself. Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, yeah. 
So our company is much small, smaller. We don't have a lot of money to do IT. So what I notice is that the, the IT fit project failure rate internally is very high. Uh, larger pro projects are more likely to fail than a smaller one. Um, larger group is more likely to fail than a smaller group. So it's just some of those issues. And then what we did was instead of um, just say, okay, it's going to fail, let's, uh, let's do smaller project, we, we kind of look at the failure itself as an asset rather than problem because the IT failure uh, helps you to identify the problem of the organization itself. If you don't do the IT pro uh, project, sometimes you actually don't really crystallize where the problem lies. The failure crystallized where the issue. There, those are the intangible asset to me as a CEO because we always look at measure the success. But looking at the failure helps you to identify some of the key problems in the organization. Um, so what we decided to do is um, Early failure is cheaper than later failure, right? So take the early failure as an opportunity because that gives you the warning of your problem that's pretty acute and at the core level, and then try to solve those problems. And then being a smaller organization, we have to break the problem down. So we, we decided to break the problem down quarterly. Like I was reading the progress with the open government document, and I noticed that you have this 60 days, 90 days um, <coughs> mandate on what people need to do. We kind of do similar things. So every quarter we solve one problem, and the entire corporation is focused on this one and committed. And then other than your daily job, you have to do your daily job. But every quarter we are committed to make one thing better. So at the end of the year, we actually make four things better. I find if at the beginning of the year I tell everyone to solve four problems, at the end of the year I get four problems not solved. But if I say solve one problem each quarter, and if we decide that we can solve this problem this quarter, make it later. <laughs> solve the one you can solve, and everyone has to be committed to that. And that seemed to be a um, very problematic way to do it. I was just going to ask, in terms of uh, spectacular IT failures, uh, how many of you have uh, stories to share in terms of how you were able to navigate through them? You talked about... Is this on the record or not? <laughs> <laughs> he says that with a smile. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to make sure I was introducing Peter Orzak, who's the director of the Office of Management and Budget, and also uh, Jeff Zients, who's the chief performance officer. Well, we certainly have a whopper for company our size uh, threatened the company. Uh, in 2005, maybe you will recall, uh, there was a wave of consolidation in <clears throat> the communications industry, AT&T, Bell South, uh, and uh, uh, Singular came together, Verizon, MCI, WorldCom came together, and uh, we at the time at least thought uh, we needed to bulk up, so we, we bought a Serially, seven companies, which tripled our revenues from about a billion six to about five billion. And uh, prior to that set of, uh, of acquisitions, we we're growing about 20% a year in recurring revenue business. That's a good clip. I mean, we, we don't sell boxes, we're a service company. So we get to bill what we sold yesterday and the day before, plus the increment we sell today. Uh, our whole operational processes fell apart. And just to give you one metric, uh, which is very important to our customers, when they order communications capacity, they're generally building it into their capability to meet their customers' needs eight, nine months later. So if we promise them service in 45 days, that's critical, or they disappoint their customers. And our service interval doubled or went from 45 to 70. These are averages that hide a lot of complexity. 80, 90 days, uh, huge problems. And uh, as you might imagine, when that threatens the company, I got personally involved. Uh, I suspect like many who aren't in the IT business, IT was a staff function that I paid attention to, but nowhere near as much as I did afterwards. And for what it's worth, I. I think you brought the word up that I would suggest is at the center of a lot of the 
problems that any institution has. Institutions are generally organized functionally. They get a sales function, some kind of production function, some kind of perhaps engineering function, a planning function, a finance function. Uh, there is no process generally that matters that's organized that way. They all cut across uh, functions, which makes traditional corporate organizations uh, totally inadequate to define uh, by, by themselves the, the requirements, uh, which means you've got to focus around process, which is a new thing in most organizations. If you ask most organizations, what are your processes, you wouldn't find them documented very often. There's a whole body of, of work in this area. It's fairly new out over the last 10 years. But you know, there's governance processes, there's support processes, and there are core processes that have a customer at the end. If you don't know what your processes are, if you haven't documented them in some form of common language, if you don't know the data, that support those processes, and if it's not clean, you're just automating something uh, that is broken to start with. If you spend more of your time and money on process uh, documentation, and there are lots of ways to go about it, if you have somebody assigned to own a process, which is key to all of this, where it cuts across normal organizational boundaries, and whether your data is in a bunch of silos or you have a modern side base uh, uh, database system, if it's clean and you've got data integrity, I think the automation process, while it's not simple, is doable. If you don't have those steps to start with, it's simply not doable. And I'm an outsider in the government, but I would argue you have that problem perhaps more than any institution. You've got isolated, segmented, siloed, uh, poorly uh, documented processes, you got data that whose, whose, whose integrity is questionable, and if, you, if I were putting money in, I'd put it in to fix that, and uh, IT would be the, the tail, not the dog. Though documentation may be the, one of the you know, exceptions to the rule where government may start out, in some cases, ahead. I mean, it, it, because of the, the regulatory processes that we have, the legal structures we work with it, so many of our processes are heavily documented. One of the things that people often complain about is the processes are too inflexible. Uh, but if, if, it, if in fact that, that is the thing that's key to planning IT more effectively, it's something we, it, maybe we should see that as an advantage. If, if I'll toss out one more notion, then I'll defer. When you say documented, uh, if it's not documented in some form of language that matches up your ability to automate those processes. Uh, what, uh, you, business process markup language, for instance, is a big deal right now. But whatever you choose, uh, if it's not documented in some way that uh, the State Department process matches up with, uh, with uh, the DHS process and you've got some common way of describing things, you really don't have process documentation. Yeah, yeah so the way we would say that is you're not aligned. Right. So documentation and clarity are words that people go to when we use all of those. But what we do is we put someone on a project who is only there to make sure people are aligned. And what we have found, because we operate in 80 countries, is they use the exact same word, but they mean different things. And then they go off and go do something, and it's documented, it's in there, and everybody says, yeah, I understand that. And then you go away and you find out, well, why did you do all of that? And you found out when you really asked what seem like sophomoric questions, mm -hmm. which only an outsider can ask, mm -hmm. or kind of a, tr a transversal kind of knowledge person who is not associated with the project says, I don't think you're really talking about the same thing you're talking about. You find out they weren't. And when we get misaligned, we stop a project and start over again. I think that's a kindly stood observation. The two are related, because when you do an acquisition, or when you're trying to merge together right. departments that ran as separate stone pipes, they will speak different languages without knowing they speak different languages. With the same word. And some, exactly. And sometimes it's actually, when, you're, when you have somebody speaking French and someone speaking German and someone speaking English, 
you know they're speaking different languages. The more pernicious find, kind I find is the subtle one where you're both speaking the same uh, nominal language, uh, but you're using the terminology in a different way, uh, and you don't understand the math. So I would say that the characteristics of projects that we've had that stumbled have had one of the two characteristics that the two of you described. Either it was because we did a, a merger of different organizations that had uh, uh, non-homeotopic uh, uh, ways of doing approximately the same thing, and so creating the map between one and the other was very hard. Uh, or you had people that literally thought they were, meant the same thing and they didn't mean the same thing. And of course, those two problems are related and they compound each other. So if there would be a way that you could score going into a project, what is the uh, sort of cultural complexity of this project? And as a probably an exponential function of the cultural complexity, uh, hash through that up front. Uh, hash through the terminology issues, hash through the, the business process mapping issues. And then once you have that sorted out, which you could say is a form of strategic plan, but it's a strategic plan uh, uh, set of issues that are uh, intrinsic to those kinds of complexities, the ones that Glenn started us out with. I think the cases where we've done that up front, it's a little laborious, it may seem a little bit bureaucratic, but we've had much smoother sailing downstream when we recognize the complexity of that up front, frankly. Sometimes, because we didn't recognize it up front, we went back and did that, and then we had a smoother result. You know, the interesting thing about Rob's point and I was really listening to the, to the points that were, that were made just a second ago about you know, enterprise threatening failures or, or enterprise threatening circumstances, and, and I should have said it in the front end, is if the challenge of integration is more discreet, as Rob says, because it's language or it's culture and it's transatlantic or transpacific, you don't have to work so hard to actually get at the, the, the issue of cultural integration because it exists already for you as a big threat to success. The same, I think, is true in, the, in mergers and acquisitions. And I was just thinking about your point, Robbie. Having been through a number of those, it, it, there's no argument on the front end that you know, Chevron and Texaco have two very, very different systems. We're going to have to integrate them, and there's going to have to be a lot of discipline in the process. So that part of the discussion that you, you were talking about, I mean, sort of the the passive aggressive behavior from function to function doesn't exist because that discussion's up front. And I think in the government, from department to department, you know, organization to organization, having that discussion discreetly up front ought to be of some real benefit. It would be interesting to know who has the responsibility to say these departments really aren't aligned and this project's going to fail. Yeah. Because if it's the executive sponsor, the executive sponsor right. sometimes has the only, their, that issue as well which is they think they're getting agreement because you have clarity, but you, what you're getting is agreement on something that may not get you to the design phase that, that goes really fast. So I, 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 I wonder if when we look at government, there's another difference that is worth focusing on a bit. If there are different divisions of a, of a company that have been merged because of acquisition, once you're together, um, oftentimes it's the same business. Multiple airlines are, are being joined. Sometimes you're doing different things and, and it's, it's different enterprises, but still there's a common drive towards uh, your common uh, overall business objective and, and, and the way you're accounting for your business. I had one question um, for our industry partners on that merger issue. So when you do the mergers and systems consolidation or alignment is part of it, um, how does the money go with it? For instance, in DHS, we consolidate it into department, but the money is still siloed, appropriated to the individual department. So our CIO sitting behind you, Richard, has a real challenge. Um, how, how important is that? Do you have any advice specifically in well, this? Well, I think they come together for different reasons because they come together for clarity uh, of accountability, clarity for uh, synergy capture, and you've gone to the investing public and said we're doing this because we're going to create value that we couldn't otherwise create, it's a bit different than the efficiencies that someone perceived would be a benefit by joint, you know, putting two departments together here. So do you think it's imperative to actually centralize the money or are there ways to do it without centralizing the money, I guess is my... I think it goes back to what somebody said about complexity. I mean, if you don't... Well, money is governance. Yeah, right. so if you don't have centralized <laughs> governance, you're going to have yeah. a fractured uh, project That's definition. But I, I probably wasn't as clear as I should have been. I, the M&A environment simply pointed us at a problem that was there, simply amplified the problem. And you used the right word, alignment. 
across organizations that are organized vertically and all processes go horizontally. And uh, generally what happens is a requirement poorly described is tossed to IT. IT is asked then to come back and document business processes and they're the worst organization to do that. They don't have ownership. Uh, but the hard part, this is hard stuff, but make no mistake. If it were easy, we wouldn't be sitting at this table. What makes it hard is you've got to figure out some way to get a chain of people in, across vertical organizations to get aligned. And the, that's the, not the, easy. The, the question I was going to drive towards in terms of alignment is, when, when, if we talk about you know, the, the Treasury Department and the State Department, we have core missions that are very different. Right. Our systems are built to help us achieve you know, very, very different basic goals. There are a lot of occasions when we have to work together. Um, and could use other examples. I'm just using because Neil and I are sitting across the table from each other. I could use DHS as the example. So when you talk about aligning, what we're really talking about doing is aligning the area where we overlap. That's absolutely When our systems well, are designed for our core missions. The, beep, the business, business process yeah. management uh, theorist would tell you what aligns you is an output on one side and a customer on the other side. You can define every process in terms of some output that some customer needs. You know, I, I, we'll, we'll get into a level of complexity we probably but, don't want but, here. But I think that that's even a better example, is that what happens is, is you've got these two completely different departments, agencies, for different purposes for a reason. Yeah. That shouldn't change. One's but a customer. Coming, but they're the coming other. together for a reason. Is that reason that they're coming together, who even in these in one government, but different agencies, they use completely different language and think of the same word in a different way. But if you don't get alignment on what the, when you're working together, mm -hmm. this is the alignment. It goes to John's point, it's, it's clarity with alignment. Because sometimes clarity is, is, if you don't have alignment on there, and then what's happening is you're all using different words and different definitions, and, and, and you can see it exactly when, when the project starts going away is when people are starting to interpret what they think they need and they're interpreting it from their own world. So can I pick up a point? I think, Elaine, you asked an interesting question that I think might highlight what everyone's saying here. If you acquire a company and then do you basically pull their budget out? I, I would frame the question a little differently. First off, I think we all know if you acquire a company and you take their budget away from them, you probably shouldn't have bought them to begin with because if you don't trust them to do something um, in terms of building products or marketing products or selling products, or whatever it is you bought them to do, um, then you know, they lose their autonomy and they usually lose their motivation to live and you end up having bought something that evaporates. Maybe you bought IP and you're okay. But almost invariably, you, when you acquire a company, and this is what's going to get on to the point about various government agencies, when you, when you acquire a company, you often defer a decision on an ERP implementation. You say to yourself, um, we're going to let them continue to have their order entry system because it's built into their culture. We're going to let them have you know, different accounting standards. Sometimes I've seen people leave them with different fiscal years. And it, it just hangs out there and causes frustration and irritation and um, ineffectiveness and frankly false expectations about the way they're supposed to work in your organization because you can't do the processes that Jeff and Jim have been talking about if you've got somebody that operates so independently and a lot of times in an M&A deal you end up sort of half promising an executive team a certain amount of autonomy, autonomy. and you find yourself hung by it later and you finally say oops I just blew it so anyway this is what would bring me back to your situation when you acquire another department or the reporting lines change or arguably when different government agencies have to you know, share a database. You know, my argument here would be you do need these processes to work across. You do need single database, preferably SIBase based on this table. Um, but you do need to define those processes, understand the customer. Uh, and I don't know that if you can get the US Census to work with a no-fly list, um, I would hate my name to show up in the wrong spot. But ultimately, a database of, of people and permissions seems like one thing to me. It seems like one thing with a series of processes with a number of different users, and it, it's going to take um, a knuckle dragger of a CIO to drive that kind of a thing through people with different agendas. Um, I don't know how you'll ever pull it off. It you doesn't know, John, seem like it's easy. If you're, 
we're, we're a, as you can imagine, we're a very discreet client of uh, DHS. So, you know, on, on all of your behalf, we're, we're the customer. And, and I think the, the thing that I would say to you is if you start with what everybody has said in defining the mission and, and then examining the process that will support the mission and lead to success, you'll find that a lot of the periphery stuff is really just that. I mean, it's really not core to the mission of DHS. And, and if you just focus on that, and you know we are in, I'm sitting down here in my Blackberry talking to your boss, so <laughs> we're, we're constantly trying to make certain that we mutually understand one another's approach to the mission. It, it, you almost perfectly comport to just about everything everybody said. So, uh, Elaine, I, uh, I see, so th we're talking two level of things here um, to answer your question. Uh, when we acquire a company, I suspect everybody here too, is they let them to have their own, uh, let's call it customer relationship management, was customer facing data. That's an application they let alone. Order entry will be an application. But I have very seldom see acquiring a company and leave the IT budget separate. I, I, I almost have never seen a two IT department. You know, there may be two sales team because they have, and then eventually every one of us find ways to merge the customer data so that both sales team gets advantage of each other's. And therefore the sharing of data between states or treasury or DHS and whatever. That makes a lot of sense. So we're now, the, now, the, now the problem is scoped to how do I make two sets of application talk to each other to get some more uh, intelligence out of it? Uh, right. But I have never seen, I mean, maybe there's, there's here, but I have never seen that I, we bought a company and then you leave, I leave you with your IT budget. The reason why we have to centralize the IT budget is because then this is the only hope that in the future the infrastructure will come together for saving money and making more efficient and more manageable for governance reasons, for a whole bunch of risk management, a whole bunch of reasons. Can't let everybody go off and do their IT stuff. John, um, John Gage, you, you, we've been talking about technology um, uh, you know, that affects processes and uh, obviously a lot of the, the, the processes, all the processes affect uh, people and uh, you've been an observer and participant in, the, in this process uh, from the perspective of, of federal employees. It would be interesting to hear your response to some of the, the things that have been uh, on the table. Yeah, I'm abandoning all hope, but um, <laughs> it's, um, you know, when I think about the, all the different parts of the government, and for instance, trying to simplify it, even the claims processes, for instance, if you take CIS, Social Security, Veterans, IRS, that's tough. Even when we tried to, the no match list, when they wanted the social security records mm -hmm. on for immigration purposes, there was a big pushback within social security on that, as well as people all around the, all around the country. But the thing about our people that I think is so good is, uh, for instance, social security, which is the only one that still has its own IT. I mean, they have 2,500 programmers up there. It's a band-aided system. Right check, right time, but I don't think anybody could <laughs> Only the people who, who know it could, real, could really change it. But the thing about it that makes it so exasperating are the changes that Congress makes. You could have the best strategic plan in the world. Pow! You have a new program, a new a change that is, you know, everybody hit the, hit the mattresses and, and trying to get it accomplished. So it, it, it's amazing that the government, I think, has operated as well as it has. And I think it really comes down to the employees who just take these things and say, oh, God, look what we got to do now. Can and, I ask a uh, question? Yeah. Are there really 2,500 yeah, IT uh, people? In Social Security? Uh, Social Security? Yeah, our, our, uh, our uh, systems operation is, uh, is pretty big. Sir, I'm, I was the CIO of the IRS. I had 7,000 employees. Uh, 4,000 contractors. I, 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 I wouldn't want to prescribe anything. I'll make an option. <laughs> <laughs> well, this so is there, isn't a, there is an executive around the table that, you know, I, I track nigh on 100 million consumers and their behaviors as they match up, play games, have permissions, et cetera. Very different thing. 
Right. Trust me, if, they, if the football doesn't appear, they get really angry. <laughs> okay? Not the same as not getting your check. But um, if I've got 35 people doing that, it would surprise me. And an observation is, I'm guessing that legacy systems bolted together, yep. band-aided, challenging processes, a, a lack of understanding of who should have access, who can write to the system versus who can just pull data from the system. Bunches of, I don't know what all the issues are, but that's, that's expensive. But you, you just said the legacy systems issue, and again, new systems for legacy is probably the biggest challenge that the IRS faces. Yeah. I would argue that many of them. Well, look, Congress so, legislates changes the tax all the time. Every day is mind numbing. You know, increasingly uh, we do policy in the government through the tax code, and every one of them involves a whole lot of changes to the code and to therefore to the systems. And it well, is, I, I have about a thousand yeah. programmers who did nothing but deal with the tax code issues from Congress. And that's because of the number of changes or because yeah. of the number of people. Yeah. There's there's no no it, it would vary, right. but three to six hundred significant changes a year. You know, I don't, I don't think that that should be viewed as t orders of magnitude no. different from what you'd see in businesses that have similar dynamics. If you take a look at the parts of our industry, uh, the old telcos that provide you with plain old telephone service when you pick up your phone, they have tens of thousands of programmers. Uh, in their IT department, tens of thousands of them dealing with systems that were developed 20, 30 years ago that are huge, do enormous transaction volumes, and you can't pause and say, fine, I'll tear it down and go build something. There's lots of examples of people in our industry who've headed down a modernization path and then just backed away uh, because the risk was so high of breaking something that couldn't break. So I don't find that unusual, which is why I get back to call it what you want. I think alignment's a fine deal. Why spend your time automating something before you know what it is you're automating? You know that, it, that the data you have, regardless of where it is, has integrity. And you've taken a look at the process and attempted to at least document it clearly uh, and then maybe simplify it a little but at least have documentation, integrity on data and process. And I think that, that being well put, I think that um, taking that uh, uncertainty and magnitude of change, that, that change environment in which you have to succeed, obviously has to be part of the definition of the mission, and, and that risk has to be accommodated in the clarity of the plan that you put together. It, it, it's it's a clear component of I think something that's unlikely to change to hear you tell it. If it does, you got the wrong mission. Right? That, that, that strategy right. defines your mission. Your mission right. defines your processes, exactly. and those should have some durability. I, I those should like, change every eighteen months. Right. So I think you do have an extra challenge in that you do have probably a ton of legacy systems that you have to deal with. But I think the way we look at it at some point is we say we're not going to invest any more in adding functionality to the legacy system. We're just going to start figuring out how to extract the data from it and move on. And so it's not a simple task, but at some point we just say you're um, and investing. How do a new system with the data from the old system and then build the new system? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as soon as you try to tackle that major issue of like the IRS for cutting a check. I think what happens is you just went right down the rat hole fast. Well, so, I mean, so to in come fact, in and say, I'm going to solve another problem and over time just keep picking and pulling away is at least a realistic approach mm -hmm. that you can then use contemporary kinds of technologies. You can get the alignment a lot faster. If you want to get alignment on rewriting a major core system, I think you're done. So, so I think it's the, the strategy has to read. I'm going to let all of that inefficiency, which is really annoying everybody, I'm going to let that sit there because I can't tackle that right now. But I can tackle these other things, and eventually I'm going to change the culture enough and change where I can get at some of those things, and the problem won't be as big. But solving the big fish and something as large as the government, I, I, I think it's a disaster. You're right. So, <laughs> well, that, that's where you build those giant uh, IT projects that hit a certain 
point and you say, oh my God, I've got to abandon it after I've spent $780 million, well, that, that was or $2.8 billion yeah. or tax on FAA or tax or whatever it is, yeah. Can I say, well, this has been extremely useful. What I would love to do is see how we can distill some of these ideas into concrete, uh, actionable recommendations for the government. Maybe we can do a quick lightning round. Um, and I'd love to get your thoughts in terms of what what could we do in the federal government? Uh, maybe one or two recommendations that you think would be central as we think about managing these large IT projects, uh, 76 plus billion dollar budget, and modernizing some of the outdated processes uh, that you're responding to. John, can we start with you? Yeah, I, I you know. I know the subject is IT, but I, I would, you know, in the business world vernacular, I would really establish it as your business strategy. And then the IT is an enabler. But you get, you know, to everything that's been said, business strategy, take that into a clarity of what your objectives are, have some clear owners, and then execute. I would pick a few beacon projects. I'd pick three or four projects that are really important, um, that are uh, some of which involve things like inter interdepartmental uh, collaboration, some of which involve maybe one organization to do it. And I would put extraordinary amount of management attention to make sure they succeed so that one of the things you can do is avoid the cynical belief that nothing's going to change because nothing ever changes. And you can propagate best practices into the organizations much more uh, effectively by having two or three exemplars of it working that will then propagate and ripple through. Because with $76 billion, you're obviously not going to change it all at once. So I pick maybe three or four, maybe it's half a dozen, but a relatively constrained number of cases where you know you're going to make a huge difference, and it'll make a difference uh, substantively and uh, symbolically. I think uh, we, we touched on a bit, but we didn't spend a lot of time today talking about We talked about process. We talked about purpose. We didn't talk a lot about ownership of who owns these projects and, and uh, you know, how they work along uh, what I would call the gating process. And then at the end of the day, you know, do you have the same people that are responsible all the way? Because I, I have a sense that some of these are longer term and you have a lot of turnover and so nobody really owns the project. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but I, you know, I have a sense that that's a risk here because of the complexity and, and some turnover in regular change in leadership. In change in yeah. leadership. And, and the other thing I, I heard early on in the discussion was a lot of uh, focus on simplicity, you know, off-the-shelf software, keeping the processes simple. And yet, as you talk about it, you're talking about complexity that is created perhaps through Congress, through the regulatory environment that the project team has no control over. And there's no way for them to push back. So that's a, that's a question. That's not a solution. I, I think that's a, a description of the general environment and one of the reasons we're having this conversation. Yeah. James? I'd uh, do exactly what Rob mentioned. I'd make sure I picked a small number of projects that had a high chance of success. And then I'd add that I would make sure either internally or externally I had some people who were really smart on the state of the art of business process management. That's a whole discipline separate and distinct from IT. Uh, and at least in my view, key, it's key to success in IT. Yeah, I mean, it, it's similar. I think the way, the way the words we would use in our company are things like they have an outside-in view. What do they really need? Why do they need it? create a small set of high impact systems that go at starting to bite away at these big beasts. Don't bite, don't go after the big beasts. Start from the outside and, and, and come in with a small defined set of projects. I'll go back to the president. His comments, they were really smaller projects where he was talking about some of the challenges. The, 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 the Department of Defense and the VA system. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. I'd resist the urge to believe that. 
I'd resist the urge to believe that every IT project is so different uh, that you have to do it yourself. Uh, there is software that we all leverage around the table, even though we run different businesses that have helped us uh, run our business. So there is software that you can leverage across different departments, uh, which goes to the don't make it overly complex, the 18 months. I'd also highlight successes. There are a lot of successes that you've had, and the more it's uh, less of the stick and more of the carrot about what the benefits are of IT, I think that could be aspirationally why people say, yeah, we'd love to be part of this agenda of transforming, which, which I applaud you for taking on. No, I'll, 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 I'll do the life cycle and I mean, everything is, you know, makes sense. And uh, I do the life cycle and the culture part. Uh, the life cycle part is really control the specs. Um, you know, we, it, the spec time can be that long. It, it has to be very identifiable. It has to be aligned. You know, even if it's a much smaller project, you might want to take a $780 million project, break it into three pieces, um, and then say nothing's more long, longer than 18 months and do what you can with that. And if you can't do it, we, we can it. I mean, that's basically that. I mean, it, it, so I, I would do that. And then after that, then you take that and celebrate those successes, then you get the, you know, the, the employee, the federal employees get excited about it, and then everybody's kind of looking at an 18-month success. And that's not a bad thing, actually. I assume you mean 18-month projects, which lead to outcomes where if you stop there, you have something useful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But if you yes. keep going, you get to go after the beast. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't, you, 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 yeah, you stop it and then, right. and then you define the next 18, uh, the different project. Yeah. It, 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 that's the same as chipping at the problems and not trying to bite the core. Uh, it's the same as that. And, uh, and everybody would like the little success. Think of Biting at the core, though, is. It's tempting. Is seductive. <laughs> it's tempting, <laughs> but you never <laughs> deliver anything because you're biting at the core. Right. Yeah, you're right. I guess two things. Um, for federal employees, uh, it, it's really embarrassing when our agencies get fleeced. And this has really happened in big, to Social Security, IRS, FBI. And um, there has to be some either oversight or centralized group that is going to uh, make big purchases, I think. But, but the other thing, you know, and the president, when he brought up the president, he was talking about General Shinseki. The moment he walked in, I'm going to make the VA paperless. Have I heard that before? <laughs> uh, and, and they have made, for instance, he's talking about the veterans' benefits, which is delays, back, all that. And, um, and Social Security did the same thing. And much of it is automated. There's the straight retirement claim coming out of Iowa. No problem. You know, the disability case coming out of Puerto Rico and dependents, little different. So a lot of this paper that's floating around are exceptions that I don't know if you ever can get to it with, with the congressional changes and with the complexity of the existing laws. So I'm hoping to tamp down General Shinseki a little bit about trying to make the whole, I think he's really running into a wall and trying to you know, bite off the core thing where exceptions are, they're just going to be exceptions that have to be done in another way. So, um, I actually really support what has been said so far in terms of a couple of beta project, really simple peer process definition. So I have one tactical suggestion for how to make that come together with your two or three important beta projects you want to push through. Get all of your stakeholders together, have them put up all their system requirements, have them rank them a, B, C, D, E, F. Draw the line under A. Tell your successor he can deal with B through F. <laughs> Keep it just there. You're going to seduce them into listing. They will tell you what's more important. But, you know, you got three years left, we hope, maybe seven years left. Draw a line and get an accomplishment completed that works. And then go back for the B priorities. That can be another project in and of itself that adds functionality to it. You know, where the process definition can take place, but A is only. Um, I, I want to just use the analogy about um, building cathedrals and laying the brick. Uh, I think it's, for whatever the project is, it's important that everybody on the team knows you're building a cathedral, you're not building a bridge. Um, so kind of have the end in mind. It doesn't mean this cathedral is exactly end up to be how you designed it, but it's a cathedral. 
and then then the people who are working on it need to know how to build the, how to lay the brick because laying brick is a simpler task than thinking about cathedral sometimes you have a vision but everybody panic because they don't know how to build a cathedral and so so the people's task is I mean just using the analogy of laying the brick they need to have a line of sight that what they do every day is going to be part of this vision and then so so when you're building the cathedral, there'll be failure. Something doesn't come together, right? And, and don't just take it and throw it away as a termination. Look at it, why did it not come together? And take that as an opportunity, as a correction, so everybody learns how to build the bricks, or lay the bricks that do come together. But because everybody knows we're building a cathedral, it will come out as a cathedral. Uh -huh. I, I'd agree with what obviously what everybody said, and I, and I suppose going back to where we opened the discussion, I'd suggest that you take full advantage of your executive sponsorship uh, while you've got it. Because it's a pretty powerful executive sponsorship <laughs> as we heard. So. Well, thank you all very much. This, uh, this was uh, an interesting and important conversation. Uh, we're quite determined uh, speak for Vivek and, and uh, Jeff and, and the, the, the whole team, that we don't mean for this to be a conversation that happens in a couple of hours this afternoon, but that it becomes a process where we actually can make change. And uh, what we're going to do uh, next is uh, come back together and report from each of these discussions. And I know Jeff has plans to follow up with each of you individually so that uh, we can uh, tap into your knowledge, your your uh, desire and willingness to, to help uh, beyond today and, and to get some things really accomplished. Uh, but uh, let me just thank you, each of you, for taking time for your very busy schedules uh, to, to share your experience with us, your, your knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> I hope we've been able to give you a sense of the complexity of our environment, which is different from your own, but we know you each have complex environments. So. Uh, it, your experience is, is, is highly relevant uh, to helping us uh, think this through. I think what we're going to do now is invite uh, the group to go back uh, to the room uh, where the President spoke uh, earlier, and um, we're going to stand to stay behind for just a few minutes so we can pull some notes together so we can report out from this group uh, in, the, in the next session. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. One thing. I also want to recognize the fact that we have in the room here CIOs uh, from the State Department, from GSA, from Treasury, Commerce, EPA, and Homeland Security. And part of what we want to be able to do, as the President said, is learn and leverage the best ideas, recognizing that the best thinking is not necessarily within the four walls of Washington. And this is just the beginning. And as Jack said, uh, there will be follow-up steps that uh, Jeff will talk about at the main session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.